few months ago, uh, Martha and I sat down one day and just started discussing uh, this matter of the ministry, uh, the ministry that I've been in for actually about 27 years. And, and we noticed that, that the ministry took on a pattern, that it would go in one direction uh, for so many years, and then uh, after so many years, then it would turn. But it would be built off of the last direction. It was never, a, you know, opposed to the last direction. That was real interesting how the Lord uh, began to let those uh, patterns uh, begin to emerge. And, of course, we realized that we were right in the middle of uh, one of those changes, one of those, or something that was changing. And, of course, uh, then we were interested in seeing what kind of, uh, well, what was going on, you know, when these changes made. And one of the things that was very obvious was the silence of God. That was very obvious to me. And when God got ready to make a change, he got silent. And I, I thought that was very interesting. I could look back over some time and see that every time the change started, the Lord would get quiet, still, and uh, as if I couldn't find it. And that uh, would send me into a searching that would merge with a, with a change. And, and I thought it was very interesting how those changes uh, came about, and of course one of those changes uh, is going on right now, and it's been going on for about a year, and it usually takes a couple of years to get in and out, and I, I don't, uh, I'm, I'm not going to predict as to what the change is going to be. Uh, a few weeks ago, I decided that it was time to go home to glory, and uh, I was ready, and I'm ready tonight to forfeit my promise. That might confuse you, but it wouldn't upset me. And, uh, uh, but uh, about that, I'd see my children's children. But uh, I'm, not, I'm not tired. I'm really not. I, I've never been more satisfied with Jesus than I am tonight. I never have. I really haven't. I've never been more satisfied. I never realized that even in this life, I would get to enjoy as much as I'm enjoying. Uh, I'm 44. Uh, <laughs> I'm getting so close to 45, it's pitiful. But uh, it's only when you get this age that you're a little careful about how you start slinging around these ages. And, and I thought I'd never be touchy about that thing. But uh, I woke up a few months ago and realized, son, this is it. You know, after all, I've always lived with anticipation of another day. But I decided this was it. So this is history. You're making it right today, and this is it. And what you are doing now is going to all be over in a little bit. And, man, I'll tell you, things begin to I wake up around my place and me. And uh, <clears throat> I remember when I, my dad and mother was old as I am, I thought they were actually uh, just ready to be put in the graveyard. But I, I really have. The Lord's given me a wonderful life at 45, almost 45. Uh, I have enjoyed and am enjoying everything I ever anticipated. That's right. Uh, it, uh, and so the Lord is having to do some new things with me. He really is. He's doing some new things, and, and I'm willing and ready to go home if that's what he wants, and uh, I'm willing also to live out the promises that he's made, if that's what he wants. And I'm also willing to get some new ones, if that's what he wants. Amen. But, uh, you know, this life is really exciting. And many things that are happening today, I never expected to happen while I was alive. And the Lord is putting some things together. It, it's just unreal what he's putting together. I never expected these things to happen. Jack, five years ago, uh, three or four years ago, when... You came to visit me in that hospital room, and Miss Cora Tim Boone was there that day, and some others that are even here today was in that room. Uh, you know, I, I knew the Lord would raise me up, but I never believed, I never thought that God would be taking me in the direction he's leading tonight. So what I'm saying is that life is, is actually very fulfilling, but I want you to know 
with all of the blessings. And the fact that I'm satisfied with Jesus tonight. Now, listen, friend, it's never been this rough. It's never been as tough as it is right now. That's right. I told Jack just a few minutes ago, I said, man, I've seen more of the glory of God today than I saw yesterday. And I've seen more of the devil today than I saw yesterday. Amen. Friends, he doesn't stop fighting just because you have a supernatural history. Amen. He doesn't stop fighting because you have a supernatural history. And I'm, and I'm not indicating to you, I trust that you haven't picked up that I'm ready to get out as a fire escape or a way of escape of the fire. Have I indicated that? I don't think I have. I'm not. I'm not going to leave because of that. I, I just uh, am saying, though, that the battle's still on. So if you think that there is some state of development in your life, I would hesitate to say spiritual growth because I, I think, can you grow back? You know, <laughs> can you? Uh, I'd hesitate on the spiritual growth idea, but uh, friends, in your spiritual development, I have not found one place in my life thus far where I could say, I've had enough, I've done enough, I've learned enough, I know enough, and friends, I am going to coast in from here on in. A man asked my brother-in-law one time, he says, Mike, do you ever take off? Do you ever have a week off? And uh, Mike thought, I would have probably answered and then thought, but Mike thought, and uh, he looked he said, no, I never have a week off. He said, you mean you don't take a week off? He said, no. He said, I'm always on. And friends, you better get that lesson. You may take a week off from what your activities as far as your activities are concerned physically, but you better never take a week off as far as your activities spiritually. Spiritual activities, spiritually, because if you do, you've had it. And that's what I'm trying to say to you, because, you see, I've tried to say, now, Lord, I, you know, I deserve a week off. After all, my old body's not like uh, Jack Taylor's. And, I, I, you know, I deserve a week off. But you know what? I, that week is the week the devil really fights me. And what I'm saying to you is something else. My history with God and the left infirmities does not give me a right to a day off, a week off. I got news for you if you don't know the truth about it, not even a minute off. Amen. Yes, sir, read. Right here in the middle of all the time while you've been having a good time in these meetings, I guarantee the devil's been upset. And I don't want to magnify him, but I just want you to know that uh, that you need to stay prepared in the power and the might of God and in the wisdom of God, the knowledge of God, and in the faith of the Lord to be able to stand in your right position and walk with God and deal with the devil. And I think one of our big mistakes, if you allow me to uh, say, exercise my position of a prophet for just a moment, I think one of the real mistakes that we are making in the church is that while we are doing our best to get extremely fortified, we are becoming passive and we are not aggressive and the greatest way to defeat the devil is to be aggressive. And, uh, you know, I've never seen a church that tries to get death, to get fortified against the fight the devil, that to forget and lose the battle. I've, I really... I think in our effort to get fortified to defeat the devil, we have got that the nearest way and the shortest way to be fortified is by obedience, not by learning. I think we forgot that. And while we're running around trying to stuff our heads full of knowledge, we have forgot that obedience 
makes it possible for God to reveal the truth to us. And friends, while you're on the battlefield, you can pick up the truth. Yes, sir. While we're fortifying ourselves to fight the battle, we are growing cabbage in Christians instead of just plain, balanced Christians. It's all in the head. Right. It's all in the head. You say, what do you mean it's in the head? What you are not experiencing in reality in your life is obviously somewhere other than your heart. For what's in your heart is exercised, experienced, and revealed in your life. In your life, in your environment, right? Are you not sure? Uh-huh. Amen. The most passive bunch I've found in Houston, Texas, know more about the deeper life than I do. As far as I'm concerned, they're farther away from God than anybody I've run into. Amen. They've left him on the other side. You say, what do you mean, preacher? I mean this. Dr. F.J. Hagel made this statement to me years ago when I went to Mexico to visit him. I read Bone of His Bone, and I got so stirred up about my position in Christ Jesus, the Lord and I being one, being in union with Him, I got so stirred up, and that was so revolutionary to this Baptist-trained mind, if I could say that, and I think I could, even though it wasn't too well trained. But um, I said, man, this is so revolutionary. I better go and find out if this man really lives the life he's talking about. So we caught, uh, we flew in a private plane down to San Antonio, got in a car, drove to Nuevo Laredo, and got on a Mexican airline, and that was a, that was an adventure in faith, I guarantee you. And uh, that fellow got that old plane down at the end of the runway, and he had four uh, engines on that thing, and he put them full blast. And that plane, I honestly, just stood there and jumped up and gra- off the ground. I thought for 15 minutes and then started leaping down the runway. If that, you could have had a picture of that. Friends, you could have won no telling what. Uh, and if you'd had a picture of me, there's no telling what you'd have got. And that thing, oh, brother, it stopped in Monterey and then on down to Mexico City. And old Dr. F.J. Hegel told me, he said, Son, said when you come across, he said, when you run out here and, and you're going to start preaching this life of victory, you're going to run into two different schools. And, and, you know, I'm just maybe talking to you tonight, but if you know my style of talking, I'm intending for some of these things to say something to you. Amen. Yeah, I, I'm expecting them to say something to you. And a lot of us say a lot more when we have something to say and sort of quiet about it than we do when we're hollering because we don't have anything to say. So I want you to listen. Oh, Dr. F. J. Hagel told me this very plainly. He said, son, he said, uh, when you preach the deeper life, you're going to run into two schools. You're going to run into the passive school, and you're going to run into the aggressive school. Let's take the passive school first. He said the passive school is going to preach the historical, judicial position of the fact that you have it all in Christ. And boy, they'll get up and they'll set the table and the people will study and get their table, uh, get themselves fed and they'll know all the deeper life truths and said they'll just hold all these truths up until the people are so spiritually fat. He said they are absolutely, just, just literally overcome by the great truth, the great truth of the life of victory. And he said, that kind of preaching will not offend anyone. Now get that. Will not offend anyone. And he said, then there's that other group going to come along and says, praise God, we've got it all in Jesus. And they believe everything that bunch believes. But, it moves out of the judicial, historical, positional area down into, as Jack put it this week, a conscious level. A conscious level. A conscious level. A level where you are 
experientially within your person conscious of that judicial, historical, positional truth. And that matter of taking that truth from a judicial, historical, positional position into reality in your heart will be offensive to people. The cross will be offensive. And when you preach it, he said, that group will take the truth and says, praise God, we've got it all in Jesus. Let's take it for the glory of God. And he said, they'll scare the demons. They'll scare people. And the other crowd said, look, that bunch is in the flesh. Now, friends, you can draw a line right here in Houston, Texas and see, the, see this bunch. Amen. Yes, sir. And you know why the bunch likes, most people like that first bunch? It feeds you, makes you fat, but you aren't worth a flip. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I'll tell you why they like it. It's not offensive. It's not offensive. Is it? Not offensive at all. But boy, you start preaching the large gift of Jesus Christ and the cross, and most of all, that if you put it this way, a subjective experience. Right. Now, I'm not talking about manifestations of tongues or anything like that. I'm just talking about a conscious, subjective experience where the objective truth becomes subjective reality. Amen. It just frightens people to death. They say, man, you're supposed to live the faith life. Well, the faith life is a real life that believes the truth of God and it turns into practical reality. Right? And I realize that, that in most of us, our churches, most of us Baptists are ignorant to these truths and we can stand up and say a lot about the fact of our union in Christ and still not get all of our people informed of the great truth. But now and then we get a crowd like this, you know, that's the cream of the crop that knows more about it than speakers know. You can say one thing. He said he read Hannah with All Smith, page 34, <laughs> second paragraph. Ah, he read Ian Thomas, Saving Life of Christ, page 40. Third paragraph, second line. And the devil says, Who are you? Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? Amen. Right? Amen or oh me. I heard a very unusual story one time. A man got up and introduced another fellow and said he's a coon hunter. He said, you know why I know he's a coon hunter? Of course, most of you are not. I, I've got to, I've been preaching 20 years. In the last 20 years, you know, uh, these crowds have changed from country to city. <laughs> you know, they have. Your kids have grown up, and they're all city kids, and all you old folks done forgot what a coon is and a raccoon or whatever. He said, you know why I know that fellow is a coon hunter? Not because he says he is, but he says, out on his barn, there are some hides. There's some hides. <laughs> and you know we can know what you know and we know what you believe because, friends, the hides show. Amen. Right? Yeah, the hides show. I I'm just really talking to you out of my heart, trying to say I love you. In my way of saying it. Amen. When you think a doctor, if you went to the doctor and you were a little sick... And he went in there and mistreated you and lied to you and said, didn't treat your cause problem when he could tell that you had one. Don't you think that that, that doctor would be out of order? I don't believe he'd be expecting, uh, expressing the fact he loved you. Do you? I don't think so. Well, I'm just sharing with you tonight, just talking to you out of my heart because I believe uh, there's some things that we need to face. And I wish that... Uh, 
we could get these things settled tonight because I believe that even though a lot of us are very, very familiar with the, all of our positions in Christ, and naturally it'd be exciting tonight that if I could say the truth in a different way than it's ever been said and excite you. And it'd be more blessed than that if I could get you raised beyond your emotional level into your intellectual level to where your mind got blown a little bit and said, bless God, I've never heard that before. I've never felt like this and I've never heard this. Man, that'd be exciting. That'd be exciting. In fact, we, the Holy Spirit might get things to the level here tonight that you could get revelation. Now, this week God has just opened my heart to truth. And boy, I want you to know there is no experience, subjective experience on the part of a believer that's more glorious, more glorious than the revelation of the... Be careful before you say amen to this. I want you to know it's loaded and I already see some of you and say amen. And I want you to know that amen be out of place. But friend, there's nothing in this world greater than having God to open His Word and reveal Himself to you in His truth and let you see the truth. Nothing greater than that except the reality of entering into the revelation. And most people that I know are so excited over the revelation that, friends, they have forgot that that is not reality. I got a promise. I got a promise. My well, friends, if that's the end of your quest, you're in trouble. All you've got is the result of revelation, which is Understanding and excitement. Maybe you could add one or two other things about it. Right? That's not reality. Oh, it's real, yes. But, I mean, that's not what we call the reality, is it? A promise, the revelation of God to our hearts, God showing us truth, friend, brother, that makes us totally, absolutely, completely responsible. Would you allow me to illustrate what I believe Revelation will do to you in a way that I don't think you'll misunderstand? I don't think you'll misunderstand this. Revelation for your heart concerning your life is like God giving you a baby in your home and said, There. Amen. I mean, you get the point, don't you? Amen? It's not to enlarge your head. Or it's not to stir your emotions. The only reason the understanding and the emotion stimulation is there is to give you wisdom and understanding and encouragement in your emotions as to how to react to God in that revelation so God can work the miracle of bringing it into reality. A lot of folk I know have had problems, difficulties in situations, and they've stepped out and got them a promise and says, Pray God, I've got a promise, and friends, they have missed it from there on. And I'll tell you, one of the things they've done, they have bypassed trusting Jesus into the expressions of what faith, how faith expresses itself, and they have bypassed trusting Jesus. Did you know that? You say, what do you mean by that, preacher? Bypass and trust in Jesus. Well, the expressions of faith are the first and foremost expression of faith is what? You never you know? Romans 10, 13, what does it say? Or let Romans 10, let's back up. Romans 10, 10, 10, 11, 12, and 13. What's the expression of faith? What if you believe in your heart, you'll do? What? Confess. For what man believes in his heart, he confesses with his mouth. You confess with your mouth what you believe in your heart. 
But did you know that, friends, you can receive revelation from God and run out and confess, I've got a promise, God's going to do this, God is doing this, God's going to do it, and do you know you can do that and bypass Jesus? That's legalism. That's acting out of promise. You don't act out of promise. If you go back and it says, believe in your heart, you know it says you confess with your mouth, that confession of your mouth is not a forced issue, it's a spontaneous expression. If your confession is a forced issue, not a spontaneous confession, you're in trouble. That's right. In other words, if you don't have to backslide to keep from confessing, friends, you're in trouble when you go out here and confess. Right. A lot of folk miss, get the revelation of God. And boy, when they get the revelation of God, they go out and act it out on a legalistic basis and miss trusting Jesus. And they, when they do not trust Jesus, then their confession is strictly humanistic initiated. Initiated from the human. Because the Bible says, do it, confess. Well, you can confess what the Bible says, confess every day. But if it's not in expression with the Lord, you're in trouble. You can say what God says, but friends, you better make sure God's saying what you say. And so a lot of people have missed the concept of a what it means to trust Jesus because they are working formulas and not walking with a person. Right. And formulas won't work. The Lord Jesus does. You say, well, what in the world then is the law of God for, the formulas of God, those laws and the formulas of God? And I've been working on this for about six months in my soul. And I, uh, it almost came through today and and I, have, I get to where I can say it like it's supposed to be said, it's going to come through, but I can say this, that the law of God is there to let you know what's normal. Now, it's there for a lot of other reasons. Amen. But it's there. Now, I'm talking about not the legalistic concept of law. I'm talking about the law, laws of God that's laid down. Like the law of faith. Like the law of faith. You see, the law of faith will let you know that you're not trusting God just as well if you'll just look at it. If you're able just to look at it. So what I'm, what I'm trying to say to you tonight is, friends, we need to get right back down to those little old elementary type experiences like the songwriter says, and the songwriter of this particular song is here tonight, and says, make me like a child again. Right? I mean, see, we have climbed the, the religious ladder of knowing and even in experiences to where we are not trusting Jesus like a little child again, and the history of our, the reality of God can be explained by our human ingenuity rather than the divine power of God. And oh, if you're wondering what I'm saying right now, all I'm doing is confessing. You say, what do you mean, preacher? Confessing the fact. And friends, the very things we preach, we cease to live because we, become stum we stumble over our own success. Our own success so blesses us that we do not have to trust Jesus anymore. And the reason our own success blesses us to where we do not have to trust Jesus anymore is because we're not obedient day by day. Because God's leading would always keep us challenged to obey Him that would keep us trusting Him. And so our, our success becomes a stumbling block. Our knowing our uh, experiences and all that becomes a stumbling block and most of us are not big enough Christians to repent 
of the sins that we have committed when we've stumbled over our own way of living and our own way of teaching because we want to be consistent with what we've said rather than being consistent with Jesus Christ. And most Christians I know are not big enough Christians to repent because they have got a history to keep. They've got a mold to fill. They have got a program to live up to rather than repent and say I'm wrong and be humiliated in the flesh and have God to do a fresh and new work. They are unwilling to face that kind of reality. Don't you think? I found this over and over and over and over. Right. When things are not working right in my life, I've discovered there's a principle. When things are not working right in my life, it's not God that needs an adjustment, it's me. And I need to keep readjusting my life until God can work like He said He'd work in the book. And the Lord has let us see His laws, His principles of operation whereby we can make an intelligent judgment about ourselves. Right? And one of those things that when the Lord has His rightful place in our lives, the Christian life, the Christian life is lived by the power and the might of another. Not without your cooperation, but with your cooperation. But Paul said, I labor and I strive. And he says, it's according to his workings which worketh in me mightily. Are you challenged by, by something? Are you challenged, my dear friends, to live the Christian life by objective... Object, I, I can't even get it out. My tongue can't get it out. I want to say objects out here. What's the... I'm, I'm almost saying it. And... Uh, and since I was sick, it's hard for me to get my to get my articulation right. But most of it, of course, you don't know what I'm trying to say, and so you're looking at me like a calf looks at a new gate. But I want to use the word external objects. What's the object? No, it's not objectives because uh, uh, you're. Well, that's what you will. That's what you want to reach is your objective. But it's the it's the things that you hear. The things that you hear. When we are living in immaturity and need, my dear friends, change, changing, it's the condition is there and we need changing and most of us are walking on such a level of carnality, immaturity, that we have to be challenged by external presentations of the truth of God rather than the nudging of the Holy Ghost within that worketh in us mightily when he has his way. That's right. Paul says, I labor and I strive according to his workings, which what? Worketh in me. But most of us have to come and hear Jack Taylor or Manly Beasley or somebody else to get shook up enough to even try to get spiritual enough to walk with God. Amen. So we've got to wait somebody else come along and do something else. To knock us up a little further, or down a little further, around a little further. We've never learned to walk by the anointing of God that nudges us and leads us into what? All true. Amen. Really? And it's rich pathetic. Wouldn't you think? I mean, most of us, it's been 20 years since we've changed, except in time and age and looks. <clears throat> When's the last time you had a moral change that changed your disposition? Oh, I, you know, I mean, we're in the business of having our heads enlarged, our emotions stimulated, and we go out and say, God was here today. But I'll tell you what, every time you ever met God in reality, friend, You've gone out a morally changed person, a different woman, different man, different boy and different girl. Now, how many times have you have been changed in your life? Don't count them. You'll come up having so many fingers and toes you won't know what to do. 
because you won't use many of them. Amen or on me? That's right. Our concept of God being here in the church house has just as about uh, heathenistic as anything we, we have going today. Man, we come in and say, boy, God was at the church today. And when we get off in defining what God was and how God acted in the church, we talk about something we felt and something we heard. And rather than being changed individually. Listen, how long has it been that you've gone home a different husband than you left from the church house? A different wife. How long has it been since we preachers have taken such a moral change that, friends, when people have seen, them, seen us again, they've known we've been with God? Right? Or not? You say, why are you saying our, most of our church activity... Uh, is idolatry. We, we are feeding our emotions and our intellect and not getting our lives morally changed. And Christianity is a person and that person is Jesus. And first and foremost, He changes your spirit and heart before He changes anything else. If any of you have got uh, Gothard, and I've never been to Gothard, uh, one of his basic institutes, I'm, I like what I'm seeing as a result of it. I really am. Now, I praise God, God, way the Lord's using that man. But you know, he's got a book out now about that thick, about character study. Have any of you got that book? Uh, it's fantastic. And you know what? He talks about the strong in spirit. And you know, he talks about... The Spirit of God in the Spirit of man controlling the soul of man and the body of man. And friends, you can't meet God and have God meet you and go out a, the same man or the same woman. I, I thought, I've, I prayed a prayer that uh, you might be interested in. Not because I prayed it, but just because of, of the uh, truth that's in it. I used to pray, and still do pray. Lord, help me to never let, uh, help me to never know how spiritual I am, because the day I, I know the day I discover it, I'll backslide. Amen. And I could cope. I'll be honest with you, friends. It was a lot easier to cope with a fellow that I knew was nobody than the fellow that everybody thinks of somebody. That's right. Now, I really thought I was backslid till the other day. There was a young lady that had decided to live in sin. And this young lady, once a week, came to our house. And when she decided to live in this sin, she quit her job. And we wanted to know why. And friend, we discovered is she couldn't stand to come to the house, as, even though how wicked we are. And I'll tell you, as uh, far as I'm concerned, my family is a wicked, wicked family. But I want you to know there was still enough God there that that little gal living in sin did not want to come back to that house because she couldn't stand to look at us. Yes, sir. Now, you can take that principle and see what I'm talking about. When people meet God, friends, they react one way or the other. They react by coming to Jesus, repenting, and coming to Jesus and being changed. They react by resisting Jesus and rebelling. Right. When the demons met Jesus, they started screaming out. I remember when uh, we had a meeting in Castle Hills. 
I was so weak that I had to sit on a stool and preach. But friend, I've never been weaker than I was that week, those three, two and a half weeks. But I want you to know something. I've never preached harder and I've never preached longer. And I've never preached more powerfully than all my life. And I did that week, those weeks. And you know what that church did? That church just lifted me up. And I didn't even have to pray. Now, I did pray, but friends, I was there. And it wasn't because of me. It's because the atmosphere of that church was so full of God. And I want you to know it was no time at all till Jesus became so real in that church that demonic problems began to show up. And it wasn't because they weren't there the whole time. And that, of course, began to show up. And any time Jesus walks in on the scene, the demons get upset. And you don't have to have a ministry. That's not in the Bible. Right. If Jesus is present, the devil will react to the presence of Jesus Christ that the conditions will become all so obnoxious, so obnoxiously opposed to the redemptive and sanctifying works of God that God's people will have to deal with those that are in such obnoxious positions. And if that's, that's very important. Now, we realize, friends, that there's no ministry sought here. Peter, Paul never had a ministry like that, but when... The presence of Jesus was so obvious that the demons of hell fought the presence of Jesus and it became an obnoxious situation opposing the, re the redemptive and sanctifying works of God. Paul would turn and deal with it, but never contemplate, never play. He would turn and deal and go on immediately to redemptive and sanctifying means as a result of that situation. Well, I trust that one, one prayer will get across to us tonight, and that is that we'll see, Lord, you know all this truth I know, I'm not really living. You say, well, Brother Mendeley, I am. <laughs> Any of you want to come up here and let me put you to the test? I've, I've been sort of nice tonight, don't you think? I could have said this and just flat said, Brother, a bunch of us are doing nothing in this world but playing the game of the hypocrite. Saying, Boy, I trust Jesus and I believe in Jesus and, and I'm full of Jesus and I'm doing what Jesus wants me to do. And yet, it only, you know what? Only God's Spirit can get this crowd honest. Only God's Spirit can get me honest. You can't. God can. God uses people to help us, doesn't he? Friends, we have, to, we have to have a heart to want to be honest. And when you find that heart, when you find that heart, you'll find people. Ready to go. You want me to illustrate it? Do you want me to be real personal to you? Now, the pastor hadn't said to me to do this, but this, this makes me sicker than anything else in the world. I, I, I had... I want to get back to this, but I want to approach this in the back door. That's the way I always start stuff, go at reverse. But uh, I had a very rare experience some time back. And this happened all the time while I was at the hospital in Houston, Texas. Men worth plenty of money would call me and say, Say, preacher, do you have a need? No, sir. And I couldn't lie. I tried to devise me a little plan whereby I'd always let them know I might have on down the road. <laughs> but it never would work. It just, I never could get that thing working right without lying. And I had a man that had just inherited 
a few million. And I'm talking about a fella that was from dead nothing. One day, <laughs> and he discovered the next day. I mean, friends, it's a storybook case. And this didn't happen three weeks ago. It happened, I mean, right on me. And uh, the Lord <laughs> sent this man along and he said, uh, Well, preacher, how do you live financially? Like a, a pauper, broke, or do you live? Well, how do you live, he said. Well, I said, I live by my, I live by faith. Well, he said, uh, what kind of faith do you have then? The devil said to me, he said, why don't you let him know it's weak right now? Everything's bad shape. <laughs> and then the Lord said, well, what would you tell him if your earthly father... Our father-in-law, our friend, had just done for you a couple of years back what he just had happen to him. I said, "Why, well, Lord, you know I could tell him how a fellow should live with what he's got. He said, well, he said, by the way, what is... What kind of account do you have? The Lord said that, not my friend. I got so under conviction, I had to sit there. Now listen. Now some of you are going to say, boy, you just lying, preacher. I'm not lying because I, I'm not lying any more than Jesus was when he said that Lazarus was asleep and not dead. Are you listening? Amen. I had to sit there for two hours and talk to that man just like I was rich as he was. And I didn't lie one minute. Amen. Because you see, every Christian that's walking with God is walking on the plains that he has all sufficiency in all things. And if you're not walking on that plane, you're walking like a hypocrite. Or you're walking ignorant of the truth. So, friends, he didn't have any more than I did. In fact, in bare facts, I had more than he's got. Because he was walking on the basis of a couple of million, and I was make, walking on the basis of all sufficiency in all things. And I'll tell you, I had to talk to him. And when we walked out of that place, he said, hmm. He said, uh, you, you, you're well fixed, aren't you? <laughs> I'm not lying any more than Jesus was when he said, Lazarus asleep. Was I? Huh? Are you? <laughs> That's right, isn't it? Is that right, Ed? I can see you getting stirred up a little bit, brother. <laughs> well, Jack might get stirred up. He get, when he gets stirred up, brother Jack's eyes start blinking. I, I think he's wiping the windshields off. But, um, oh, man, that, that got me shook up. And you say, well, Preacher, what are you talking about? I'm talking about this one thing. When you deal with the reality of the world about you, just for instance, in when you, when you make an offering, we'll reach in our wallet and pull out and do just like an atheist what we can afford instead of reckoning with what God wants. Right? Amen. 
You say, why, well, Brother Minley, I can give what I want to. Everything that originates with God is accepted. But everything that originates with man is rejected. First of all, God doesn't need your offering. You need the privilege of discovering God and cooperating with Him. And anything less than that is just playing the game, isn't it? Amen. Every issue in the church house should be designed to bring man to an encounter with a living God where that man can be morally changed. And everything you're doing in your church house if it's not an activity to bring people encounter with a living God to where they come to the end of themselves and meet a living God, then, friends, it needs to be jucked. Yes, sir. You wouldn't have to have but one, one good time where everything that went on in the church house, every man, woman, boy, and girl came to the end of themselves, met a living Christ, walked out morally changed to this whole country over here to be set on fire. And you say, well, we're in the community and you know when we're in the last days and, and we're this and we're that. No, friends, you just get God's anointing and, friends, you won't have all those excuses. You'll be morally changed and it'll make any difference where if you're on the backside of nowhere, they'll find you. Amen. I've never seen God set a people on fire. Start meeting with people and people meeting with God that God didn't just burst out all over the place. Never seen it, have you? Never have. I'm going to close with this. I was in uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee a few weeks ago and I, they put me downtown, or not downtown, but in, the, in town and they picked me up, take me to that church and they drove 40 miles. And I am not line and uh, that's literally so and it was in the country and brother that church is about three times as large as this and that night that thing was full and I said well it's just a bunch of old country people out here a bunch of hillbillies don't have any better sense to just go to church hadn't got enough sense to you know to read and do some constructive thing so they just go to church I looked out there and there's man that owned the Ford Motor Company in Chattanooga. Looked over there and there was a daughter, a, a lawyer, and then a CPA. And by, I didn't look very long till I saw that church was probably half full of professional people, educated people. And brother, they had come to the woods not to hear a preacher that some said was popular, but they'd come there to meet God. They met him there whether I was there or not. And you know what? Now, one explanation for it, and that was Jesus. Just Jesus on an old boy. Just Jesus on an old boy. We are so afraid of being so theologically straight that we have breathed the Holy Ghost that sets our souls on fire to where He won't even come in the church house. We've been so afraid, my dear friends, of error. So afraid of not crossing the T's and dotting the I that the Holy Ghost of God is away. They said a prophet would comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfort. And that's what I feel like that I, the Lord just let me talk to some needs here tonight. Yes, that's right. He just let me talk to some need. And of course, those of you all, you boys and girls back there talking and, and you folk who are so got so much you don't have any needs naturally you didn't hear anything but the Bible says let him that hath ears to hear hear amen so there's a lot of you didn't hear but don't forget a braying donkey could teach you something if you had ears to hear and eyes to see so you can classify yourself <clears throat> about what went on amen I trust the Lord did say something do, did he? Okay. Boy, it's been a blessing. It has. I'm not talking about just tonight. I didn't mean skinny. I don't think I did. But I thought I was real sweet with it. But, uh, but I trust that God spoke to you tonight. 
And I want you to know in the judgment we'll meet this message tonight. Yeah, these kind scare me. Yeah, those I play in the room get down. They bless me, but this, this kind scare me when I just quietly say something. Yeah. You know, and wake up 10, 15 years later. I've lived long enough to know that some of those things I said casually back years ago was straight from glory. And they've already reaped their harvest. And I trust tonight, friend, you've been listening to what God had to say through just a quiet way. You know, we expect the thunder to do something, but it's usually not the thunder that does anything. Right? Amen. Well, I've talked too much. May the Lord bless you.